Hey guys, I'm Dave and welcome to the Troll Gallery. Today we're going to finish the rebuild of this bandsaw that's probably as old as I am. In my last video I cleaned up this bandsaw that I think is about 60 years old. Today we're going to finish that rebuild by adding a motor and some new wiring, cleaning up the stand and then tuning it up so it all works properly. Let's see how that came together. The body of the bandsaw was refurbished in the previous video, and if you missed that, I'll add a link below. Now it's time to start on the motor and electrical system. Early in the process, I had laid the bandsaw on its back and loosened the mounting bolts. Then I could pull the motor and get to work. The interesting thing is that this Montgomery Ward bandsaw was being powered by a Craftsman motor. The perfect blend of 1960s homeowner's tools. Even though the motor sounded good, I just had to take it apart to clean it up and I started by removing the drive pulley. With that off, I could remove the long bolts that hold the motor body together. Then I removed the bearing covers and disconnected the power cord from the motor. I gave it a little WD-40 to soak in and hopefully help with the disassembly. As I suspected, the motor was just packed with dust and I was a little surprised to see that all the internal wiring had cloth wrapped insulation. Sadly, while cleaning up the motor, the internal wiring began to disintegrate. It was just too old and unsafe to keep. So much for a free bandsaw. Did I mention the sketchy electrical system? There were exposed wires on the face of the plug, the metal box was the wrong style, and the switched outlet was designed for lighter use. All of that stuff definitely has to go. While I waited for these replacement parts to arrive, I began to make the base a bit more functional and attractive. First I added a couple of 2x4s that I could use to mount the 3-inch locking casters to. I pre-drilled them with the 3 inch bit up through the 2x4s and into the legs of the existing base. Then I could come back and mount the casters. On the leg side of the casters, I used 4-inch long, quarter-inch lag screws and some washers. These connected the casters to the 2x4s and the 2x4s to the legs. For the other caster mounting holes, I used inch and a quarter long quarter inch lag screws and they only went into the new 2x4s. Since the plan was to use scrap birch to cover the stand, I needed to add some bottom stretchers. These provide additional strength and give me more area for mounting screws. They were clamped in place, pre-drilled and fastened with some 2 inch long number 8 wood screws. These new stretchers were some poplar strips that I had milled to the same width as the existing stretchers. I added one stretcher on each of the short sides, then two more on the long sides. I made sure to keep the screws for the long sides far enough back so they wouldn't hit the previous screws. Before adding the new sides, I decided to trim the old top flush to the base. I started by cutting off the excess with my jigsaw, leaving about an eighth inch of some old and tired plywood. Then I came back with a flush trim bit on my router and cleaned up the sides as needed. I ripped down four pieces of half inch plywood to the height of the stand, stopping at the top of the caster 2x4s. I wanted to leave plenty of room to access the caster brakes later. The two short sides were then cut to width and clamped in place. Just to keep things symmetrical, I laid out where the fasteners would go, making sure they would hit a cross member. An 18 gauge brad nail in each corner held things in place while I pre-drilled and fastened the panels with some inch and a half long number 8 screws. The front panel was installed in the same way, except the width was about a quarter of an inch wider than the side panels. The existing base wasn't exactly square, so letting the front overhang the sides would let me trim it flush later. Since I need access to the motor, the back of the cabinet will be a bit different. I started by cutting out the center stretcher with my jigsaw, and then trimming it flush to the uprights with my router. That part isn't really necessary, but I get a little fussy sometimes. The back panel is ripped into three sections. The outer sections were just wider than the opening I just made, again so I could trim the edges later. These outer pieces were pre-drilled and screwed in place like the other sides. Before attaching the door, I trimmed an eighth of an inch off the top. This way when the door swung open or closed, it would not catch on the top, I'll add in a minute. 
Then I dug through my box of hinges and found a pair of the oldest and ugliest hinges I could find. I used a self-centering VIX bit to pre-drill the holes for the hinge screws and attach them to the left rear panel. You'll notice the level clamped to the bottom of the back panel. This is just to ensure that the top gap is in place and the bottom of the door is even with the bottom of the back panels. Now I can pre-drill and screw the hinges to the door. Again, using my flush trim bit of my router, I cleaned up the back and front panels so that they were even with the sides. Needing to access the motor should be a rare occurrence, so I decided to go with a threaded insert and a lock knob. I laid out the location and pre-drilled through the door into the frame behind it with a 9 32 brad point bit. Switching to an 11 32 bit, I drilled the pilot hole for the threaded insert I was using. Just make sure you match your pilot hole with your particular insert. Then I drove home the core to 20 insert with an Allen wrench, making sure to drive the head just below the surface of the stretcher. The core to 20 knob with a washer now holds the door securely closed. For the top of the cabinet, I switched to 3 quarter inch plywood. I added 8 inch strips of maple just to clean things up a bit. Again, the overall width was just wider than the cabinet, and the top overhangs the front about a quarter of an inch. This again is mostly due to the original case not being square. This was then temporarily drilled and screwed in place. With the cabinet now on its side, I could trace the location of the openings for the drive belt and the core pass through. I also use a brad point bit to locate the mounting holes for the bandsaw. This was awkward enough in a tight space, but even more so trying to show it to you. After removing the top and laying out the locations a little clearer, I could drill the key locations from the bottom of the plywood with an eighth inch bit. I backed each hole with a scrap of ply to minimize the blowouts from this crappy plywood. I drilled the mounting holes, the cord pass through, and the location for the belt opening. Even with the scrap wood underneath, I still got blowout on each location. Now I can drill from the top, again into a backer. First, with a 3 8 inch hole for the cord, then 5 16 holes for the bandsaw mounting bolts. I made a larger pilot hole with a quarter inch bit for the belt opening, and that was followed by a 1 inch hole saw on either end of the slot. The last step here was to hit the smaller holes with a countersink. I did this top and bottom just to clean the holes up a bit. After drawing lines to connect the larger holes, I could cut out the slot with my jigsaw. I cleaned up the cut with a file and some sandpaper. With that done, I grabbed my palm router with an eighth inch roundover bit and eased the top and bottom of the opening. One last sanding by hand and the top is ready to install. Dropping the top back on the cabinet, I permanently attached it with a few two inch screws. Before trimming the top even with the sides, I added a block to the front of the case. Since I'm using a bearing guided bit, this will prevent the bit from diving in at the end. I made sure to move that block to the other side before trimming that as well. I used a scrap of half inch ply in place of the door to give the bearing a place to ride on the back. To prevent the end grain trim on the far side from blowing out, I back cut that first, then went back and trimmed the rest of the top even with the back. After giving the case a few coats of urethane, it was time to secure the bandsaw in place. This thing still has some weight to it, so I made sure to live with my legs. Then I could drop in the mounting bolts and secure them with washers and nuts from below. Before I spray painted the bandsaw parts, I would made a point to drill new mounting holes for the new switch in this piece. I marked the center line and the hole locations from the switch and used a center punch in those locations. At the drill press, I used an eighth inch bit and some WD-40 to drill the initial holes. Switching to a 3 16 inch bit, I drilled the clearance holes for the mounting screws. Now I could mount the new switch to the plate with the nuts and bolts that came with it. After a bit of juggling, I attached the plate back onto the bandsaw with its two mounting screws. Honestly, I'm not sure how long I'll deal with that huge stop paddle, but I'll give it a shot for now. My replacement motor came in, and while it set me back a few bucks, I trust this way more than the 60 year year old Craftsman motor that came with the saw. If you're not comfortable doing your own wiring, I recommend getting an electrician to make these connections for you. 
To wire the motor, I started by running the new power cord through a new hole in the back of the stand. Then I stripped about three inches of the outer insulation. Then I stripped off about a half inch off the end of each of the three wires. With that done, I could attach the female disconnects to the white and black wires and a spade terminal to the ground wire. Make sure that the ends you're using are the correct size for the wires you're working with. I had to make a trip to the stores. All the connectors I had on hand were for a larger gauge wire. Now I could attach the green wire to the ground screw on the motor and the white and black wires to the terminals shown in the motor diagram. After a quick motor test, I noticed the shaft spun clockwise and I needed it to spin counterclockwise. Again, following the wire diagram on the motor, I swapped two wires and got the shaft spinning in the correct direction. The last thing to do here was to tuck the wires in and put the cover back on. This motor has a sort of strain relief built into the cover to prevent the wires from being pulled back out. Before mounting the motor to the stand, I added the drive pulley. I secured the pulley to the shaft with its locking bolt, making sure it engaged on the flat face of the motor shaft. Now I could determine where the drive pulley should sit in relation to the lower wheel pulley. I marked that location and pulled the motor shelf out to pre-drill new mounting holes. I will show you how I bolted the motor in place, but it would have been basically 10 minutes of looking at my shoulder and back of my head. It was a little tight in there. I placed the drive belt on the two pulleys, and the hinged motor shelf acts as its own tensioning device. I decided I wanted the wires for the motor and switch to be neatly tucked in on the back of the bandsaw, so I held them in place with two cable clamps. I marked the mounting holes with my center punch and drilled the two holes. The first pilot hole was to punch through the body of the saw. The second hole was a number 9, which is the correct clearance hole for an 832 tap. Always buy your taps with the correct drills included. I don't know about you, but I don't have that many numbered drill bits laying around. I used my tap to thread the two holes I just drilled. Remember to go slow and back the tap out as needed to clear out any chips. Oh yeah, and wipe off all the oil from your new paint job. I used two 832 by half inch machine screws to mount the cable clamps to the back of the saw. This may seem like a lot of work, but it looks much nicer than having the cords dangling in the front. The last thing to do was to plug the motor power cord into the switch outlet. Tuck in the extra cord and zip tie it together so it lays out of the way and won't catch on anything inside the cabinet. At this point, you just gotta take it for a spin. Now to install the blade. The blade goes through a slot and table and then gets tucked around all the bearings, blocks, and guards. Now it should just slide over the wheel, but it doesn't fit. Every 14 inch bandsaw I've ever dealt with in the last 30 plus years uses a 93 and a half inch blade, and that's what I ordered. But that is too small. And that's when I noticed this. I don't know how I missed it or why the saw is different, but it's time to order a longer blade. While I'm waiting on the new blade, I thought I'd work on finding a suitable replacement for the throat plate. Sadly, the opening for this throat plate is two inches in diameter and only a sixteenth inch deep. That matches exactly zero commercially available options. After a fair amount of searching, I came up with these clear plexiglass discs. By all account, they should just slip in, but they don't. Their diameter is about one-tenth of an inch too large, but a little hand sanding around the edges and it fit fine. I'm going to have to cut a slot in the throat plate, so I created this jig to help. It's two pieces of quarter-inch MDF. I use a two-inch hole saw on the top piece to drill a clearance hole, and then remove the front just to make it easier to drop in the plates. I glued that to the bottom piece so that I could cut this on the bandsaw, giving me a zero clearance insert plate. I made the jig to prevent the plexi from falling into the hole in the table as I cut the slot. This jig will allow me to make additional plates later as needed. 
especially since I have no idea how long these will last. The other thing I wanted to address was the belt on the back of the bandsaw. Leaving a rotating belt exposed is dangerous on several levels, so I made this simple cover for more scrap ply. The frame is 3 quarter inch plywood glued and screwed together. The face is half inch plywood that was just glued in place. The feet are some hardwood scraps that I glued and screwed from the inside. I prepared the mounting holes and threaded inserts just like I did with the door. Since this won't really need to be accessed often, I'm just going to bolt it in place with some quarter 20 bolts and some washers. I may have to come back later and add some vibration dampening if I find that it rattles against the saw body. The new blade arrived and it's time to put it on. Once again I run the blade through the slot in the table and then wiggle it in place around the guides, guards, and finally the wheels. I can add enough tension to the blade to hold it in place then adjust the tilt of the upper wheel so the blade sits on the crown. Ideally, the center line of the wheel will be just behind the teeth on the blade. Once you get this set, you shouldn't have to make this adjustment very often, if ever. Now you can adjust the tension of the blade. There are lots of gadgets and lots of opinions, but I like to have about a quarter of an inch of lateral flex on the left side just below the upper wheel. That's a good starting point, you can always adjust it as necessary later. To adjust the upper guard, set the assembly so that the teeth are just proud of your guide blocks. Then you can adjust them side by side, leaving about the thickness of a dollar bill as a spacer. The rear bearing can now be adjusted so it either just touches or sits a little behind the blade. The lower assembly is adjusted the same way, but this one is buried under the table, so you'll have to take my word for it. After spinning the blade multiple times by hand to make sure everything tracks well, it's finally time to see how it moves under power. Everything sounds and looks good. Oh, it's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! <laughs> I determined how far the curve should go into the throat plate and made a mark on the protective film. Then I dropped the throat plate into the jig and made my first cut. Nothing left to do but remove the film and set the plate in place. Then I could fire it up again. The blade may rub on it for a bit, but in time it will wear a clearance slot. So what did my free bandsaw really cost? The motor, switch, cords and such came in at $252.14. The assorted parts like bearings, wheel tires, casters, and hardware added another $123.01. The paint and prep materials were $73.40, and the blade and throat plate added $39.57, not counting the wrong blade that I'll hang on to just in case I get another 14-inch bandsaw someday. This gave me a grand total of $488.12 which is considerably higher than I had hoped for, but I did get a brand new motor. Also a new 14 inch bandsaw, even an introductory one, is going to be more than $750. So while this may not be a Powermatic, it cuts well and beats the hell out of using my jigsaw for all my curved cuts. While I was hoping to avoid the cost of a new motor, this bandsaw should run for another 60 years or so. The new base makes it much nicer to look at, and the casters allow me to move around the shop as I need it. I look forward to using this saw for years to come. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this video. Was there something I could have done different, easier, smarter, safer? Drop in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, maybe give us a thumbs up and share it with your friends. And if you haven't already, maybe it's time to hit that subscribe button and the little bell so you get notified each time I put out a new video. Not sure what's coming up next, but it should be something interesting, so you'll have to stand by and see. But for now, have a great day. Take care. We'll see you soon.